she hasn't infected AIDS yet, but she introduced me to a group of her friends, and I really got to know, you know, the people who are really at risk of, of contracting the disease in China, and what's their life like, and what's, what, what the obst obstacles they're facing. These are the mean streets of Xichang, a city in southern China with a growing population of heroin addicts, prostitutes and AIDS patients. That's where you will find health worker Cheng Xia. If you get semen in your body, you have a 100% chance of contracting AIDS. No matter how evil a person is, there is still a side of kindness. Maybe it is just that people have not found that kindness. What I want to do and will do is to discover the bits and pieces of kindness inside people and awaken them. Chengxia helps herring addicts and prostitutes, the worst sinners in locals' minds. She brings clean needles and condoms to save them from AIDS. Located on the drug trafficking route from the border area of Burma, Thailand and Laos to China's heartland, the city has been plagued by herring since the 1990s. Fueled by needle sharing among drug users, the number of HIV cases here has been growing at a staggering rate, making it one of the areas with the highest HIV AIDS infection rate in China. I only know so many people, and 10 of them have contracted AIDS. It's unimaginable. Xichang is not a special case. The United Nations warned that without effective control, 10 million people in China may contract the AIDS virus by 2010. That is a quarter of the HIV cases in the world today. It's in the villages outside of Xichang that the government will have to wage the battle against AIDS. It won't be easy. Most people here are poor and uneducated. Our Gu Wuha, a local farmer, contracted AIDS from sharing needles with other heroin addicts. He has little idea about the disease and how to protect his family from it. Do you know how people contract AIDS? That I don't know. Wuha has had unprotected sex with his wife since they got married, and she hasn't been tested. It is very hard for him to understand the things we tell him. Feng Shijin, a local doctor, has been counseling and treating Wuha since last year. Because they are rarely in contact with the outside world. First of all, he's quite uneducated. He can't read the flyers. He can only watch the simple introductory TV programs. He only has a limited awareness of AIDS. He does not really understand what AIDS is. In the brothels on the streets of Xichang, Cheng Xia faces a similar problem. Many of the prostitutes are underage and unschooled. You tell them about AIDS, they don't know what it is. You tell them it's a terrible disease like being sentenced to death. Patients will eventually lose their immunity. But they don't even know what immunity is. Cheng Xia knows how to reach them. She's been there. Heroin destroyed everything I had. Even my memories were slowly wiped out. It blurred every moment I had lived and experienced. I hate. I regret. For nine years, she was a heroin addict, living on the streets, paying for drugs by selling her body. Three years ago, the city's AIDS prevention program recruited her as a peer educator. It was like I had climbed out of a dark cave and saw bright light everywhere, and the sunlight was glorious. Instantly I felt normal again, like I couldn't live without sunlight. Now the government is trying to promote Xichang's AIDS program nationwide. For decades, Beijing has turned a blind eye to the exploding AIDS crisis. All that changed in 2003. The government doubled AIDS funding, promised to provide free AIDS medications, and launched a public awareness campaign. I've been living with HIV since 1991. <laughs> you won't contract AIDS by hugging, shaking hands, or having a meal with your friend. Don't be afraid. Don't discriminate. Please care for AIDS patients and learn more about how to prevent AIDS. But society's stigma against Cheng Xia and her friends is deep-rooted. This is Cheng Xia's friend Wang Jiangang. 
He's HIV positive. The young fellows here who work for the hospital won't even touch me or carry me. His thigh was fractured in a car accident a week ago. It was my wife who carried me up three floors. Only a day after the accident, his fiancée was arrested for herring possession, and no one is taking care of him. I found that the physical pain was far less than the pain in my heart. I could stand the physical pain, but I couldn't stand the pain caused by guilt. I couldn't stand people's contempt and scorn. I wanted to return to normal society, but who would give me this opportunity? I don't blame society. It can only be said that we lost our way and gave people a bad impression. Now we need to change it ourselves. Chen Xia works hard to change China's prejudice against drug users and the street prostitutes. She'd like to save them all, and she'd like to save herself. I long for a completely new life, a completely new circumstance. I am willing, I am content to fight and work for it. I am striving for that future. I will never give up and never regret chasing the beauty of that moment. A lot of people live in the villages don't understand what is AIDS. It's very hard to get the message across. It's very hard for them to understand the disease, not even mentioning how to prevent themselves from infecting the disease. I think that that's, that's, that's where the challenge is. Like Elaine is that woman that, you know, everybody has in their family. She reminds me of my mom, she reminds me of my friend's mom. She's tough, she's strong. She's determined, you know, and she does what she needs to, to do. I just cannot stand the idea that I am living in an environment that sounds like, uh, you know, bombs over Baghdad. It's just unreal. Sometimes I hear them as close as the backyard and got to run in the house and hit the deck. That's just not living. You know, we try to do this job as best we can and be safe and go home at the end of the shift. That's the most important thing. Take care of each other and you know, do as best we can to try to curb some of the violence that's going on. Two women trying to do their best to survive in Richmond, California. Bloody bodies are being discovered at a horrifying pace in the city of Richmond. Ten murders in one month. Two young men were gunned down in their car on Riley and Harbor Way. Kids here are often armed, often angry, and often scared. Richmond, California. This summer, the highest murder rate in a decade. The city council came close to declaring a state of emergency in certain neighborhoods. Elaine Graham lives in one of those neighborhoods. Elon, I need your help. She's getting ready to go to one of her four jobs, just part of what this cancer survivor is doing to protect her family against the violence around them. It was getting dark and uh, we just ran up the stairs, pizza and all, <laughs> hit the deck. And that's like, okay, how much longer? I'm doing 12 hours today. Not my favorite thing to do, but Gotta do what's necessary, right? Okay, you're all set. Your gate is 9A. They're boarding at 1 o'clock. Enjoy your flight. We got a 211 robbery. Stina Johansson is one of 156 officers working in Richmond, a station that is currently understaffed by 64 officers. Apparently it was a robbery with a firearm. What was he wearing? The job takes all of her energy. By the time I get home, it's 8.30 at night. I get up at 5 in the morning, so there's really a not a whole lot of time to do anything other than eat some dinner, decompress, go to bed, and wake up for the next day. Still, it's a challenge that she sought out. What's your sister's name? Teresa. I feel like for a new officer, I've got a lot of opportunity to experience lots of different things in a short period of time. A year goes by and you've seen a lot in this city. In addition to her multiple jobs, Elaine has more work at home. She homeschools her son, Elon an alternative not very common in this community. I don't allow my, allow my son to go to school here in this environment, only because um, I understand the process of assimilation. Once you be, get in an environment, psychologically, you start to assimilate. And I also, um, unfortunately, feel safe with him in the house. I don't want to stereotype, but I think as a, as a black male, it's just a little different out there. Alon doesn't spend a lot of time hanging out on the street. He keeps busy doing other things. Homework and uh, uh, cook and do art and stuff like that. Especially be a kid. He spends a lot of time in the kitchen and attends college classes. He's even published a cookbook. I can graduate like in 11th grade and as soon as I have that I can go to culinary school. So it might move my career faster. A 15-year-old with his career mapped out. That kind of a drive 
is a family tradition. Um, I'm just terribly focused and as a, as a young child I was exposed to quite a bit in terms of education. As a young girl I have six aunts and two grandmothers so what role models? You know it's eight people in your life to influence you. Let them know that no yeah, checks uh, are to be sent to that address. Or, Officer Johansson is happy to be working in Richmond, but others around her were concerned. Well, I can tell you how my family reacted, <laughs> which is they weren't too happy with that decision. Open the door! Abierto! We're real close, and I think it was hard enough that I moved from Seattle to the Bay Area, but then to tell them five years later that I'm making a career change and becoming a police officer wasn't too thrilling. Then to add on top of that, I was going to work in the city of Richmond, really kind of it over the edge but they're starting to come around now richmond historically has had a high crime problem a violent crime problem um you've also got people who have been you know born and raised here who's got generations of family that are from richmond that have a lot of pride in this city despite all of richmond's problems elaine does not plan on leaving anytime soon she was born and raised here her life is here and so are her dreams. I would like to be up in the El Cerrito, Richmond Hills and walking early morning, late at night with the deer and skunk and possum. I'd like to be in a safer environment, but at the same time, I don't want to turn my back on my community. I, I want to give back and I want to teach and help rid the city uh, of the violence by educating and inspiring. So, you know, they're hanging by a rope, so to speak, but they still love their work. They're passionate about what they do. So that's why they're there, because they love the challenge. I heard about it on the radio, actually. I heard about it on um, the California Report. And I thought, well, why seems like such a white industry? When do you ever hear about Mexicans being owners? So I just wanted to give them a call and went up for a visit. And I thought, OK, I'll pitch this. It's harvest season in Napa Valley. The workforce here, like in fields across California, is largely from Mexico. Welcome to Ceja Land. Across the field, Pedro Ceja showcases the fruits of his family's labor. I mean, if it was up to us, we would be bottling grapes, really. <laughs> At 4,000 cases a year, Seha Vineyards is a small player in the $15 billion California wine industry. Still, their wines are served at some of the most recognized restaurants in the country. The Seha family began bottling wine in their name in 1998, but the work in the field started many years earlier with their father, Pablo. I came here in 1957. Uh, a trabajar como bracero temporalmente uh, por un contrato de tres meses únicamente. The Bracero program was created to bring farm workers from Mexico to fill labor shortages during World War II. More than four million Mexicans boarded the trains to El Norte, hoping to improve their lives. Cuando yo vine la primera vez ya tenía dos de familia, ya tenía una, un hogar que mantener y Y ya no me alcanzaba, por eso fue que inmediatamente oí que para acá vienen a trabajar y a mí me dio por, por calarle y vine y le calé y... Amorcito corazón, yo tengo tentación de un beso. Entonces, pues uno, uno quiere mejorar o, o mejorar económicamente para bien de su familia. Fifty years later, the man who came to pick lettuce walks through the vineyard he bought with his sons. And behind those vines are today's Pablos, motivated by the same promise. Hombres y tres mujeres, y yo soy el más chico, el hombre. Y les ayudo, igual mis hermanos les ayudan. Como que, ¿Qué es lo que quieres tener? ¿Qué sueñas? Como una casa mía, eh, tierras mías, 
But these workers dream of a different destination. ¿Qué son sus sueños de aquí para adelante? ¿Qué son sus... Pues tener algo de dinero para el día que se quiera ir uno para México ya no venir y mantenerse uno allá. Es mis sueños. Es mejor allá. Como, o sea, como está aquí, como está allá, es mejor allá para ahí. Pablo Ceja never went back. Instead, after 10 years of following harvests by himself, he brought his family to California. In 1967, the children joined their father in the fields. Pedro, Ignacio y Armando, los tres. Y, y por cierto, lo, lo que era el salario para las personas adultas, me les pagó a los niños, a los tres, lo mismo. El salario que haya sido en ese tiempo, que era un dólar, un dólar y... no llegaba a dos dólares por hora todavía. Les digo a los niños, miren hijos, yo quiero que ustedes le pongan ganas a la escuela, porque no quiero que uno de ustedes vaya a salir maestro de la pala o de la tijera. ¿verdad? Y de los tres, el único que contestó fue Armando. Dice, no papá, dice, ¿quién va a querer ser maestro de la pala o de la tijera? Dice, tenemos que estudiar, tenemos que ser alguien y hacer algo. It was a, a dream of, of, of the family to own our own vineyard. The son who spoke up now oversees the winemaking for the family's label. So there was many, many years of savings for, for the first vineyard, for the purchase of the first ranch. Workers like Mauricio Montiel make $100 on a good day, much more than Pablo Ceja used to earn. But the money and the American dream aren't enough to change his mind. Mi papá ha venido, tiene papeles. Mi papá y... Y cuando yo estoy allá me, me platicaba de toditito esto que se cansa uno mucho y eso. Pero ahorita ya está más costumbre. Pero a ellos, o sea, por decir a ellos a trabajar aquí, no. Preferí estar yo trabajando aquí para pa que ellos estuvieran allá. Pero no traerlos para acá. The Seja family chose to stay and have not looked back. We had been working for somebody else. We wanted to, to own our own. You know, it truly is the, the American dream to be able to, to have it your own. I think it's really ethnocentric for Americans to think that this is the best country and everybody should want to live here. Um, so, but it was refreshing for to hear it from field workers because I did also make that assumption that they would rather live here than in Mexico, but these people still all have all their family and friends back there and they just want to get back. It just the money keeps pulling ba them back in. It's one thing to see a line drawn on a map, it's another thing to actually, or it's the same thing to read about the the border and the desert, but it's a whole other thing when you're actually there and you're in front of the fence that supposedly separates the U.S. and Mexico. Just two days ago, uh, we had six undocumented immigrants who came to our house um, asking for water, and there was a 10-year-old child with them, and you uh, question why anyone would bring a child through harsh desert and terrain and it, it's hard to understand these days you know you know that they're only looking for a better way of life. Vivian Juan Saunders is chairwoman of Tohono Autumn Nation a 7,000 year old reservation straddling the US Mexico border. Today 14,000 members live on the 2.8 million acres of the Arizona desert and every day and night, the tribe comes face to face with the darker side of illegal immigration. You don't feel safe um, because you don't know who these people are and what intentions they have. This is the reservation's 75-mile stretch of the international border. It's estimated that an average of 1,500 illegal immigrants cross through here every day, making it one of the busiest border crossings in the U.S. You'll see that what's protecting the United States of America is a three-strand, four-strand barbed wire fence. Once through, migrants are forced to dump all but the bare necessities for the unforeseen journey ahead. 
The next big city, Tucson, is almost 100 miles away. And this is what we don't like. The tribe has cleaned over 40 tons of garbage in the past year alone. You can hear people talking about this. Yeah, there's people talking about Officer this. Vincent Garcia and native Harriet Toro have watched what the rising tide of immigrants has washed in. When I first went back there, there were like those plastic bottles. Were, I swear they were up as high as they were that broken. Bottles, clothes, backpacks, shoes, you name it, they will be here. It's more than just water containers and makeshift shelters that leave their mark. Strings of house burglaries, car thefts, and arrests have made this a breeding ground for lawlessness. Putting the tribe in a thorny position, immigrants take up 60% of their law enforcement time. We still have poverty, we still have substandard housing, we still have infrastructure issues. It's their problem because the federal government spent millions protecting illegal immigration hotspots near California and Texas cities in 1994 with Operation Gatekeeper. That left one way in, straight through the remote desert and the Tohono Autumn Nation. The unprotected border may be the gateway to the promised land, but it's often a death trap for migrants. Last year alone, tribal and federal officials found 141 corpses under the scorching desert sun. Corpses could be anything from bones scattered across a 20-yard square foot area to um, pretty freshly deceased person. But it's the local law enforcement that has to pay for the investigation, even the autopsy, money that the impoverished tribe can barely afford. That comes out of my tribal budget there. And currently it's about $1,600 per autopsy that cost, uh, that were being charged by the Office of Medical Examiner. Many of those who survive wind up at one of the nation's health facilities. It's mandated upon us legally as well as ethically in our profession. Dr. Peter Ziegler directs the hospital and cells in the nation's capital. They're forced to spend their resources on critically ill immigrants on a reservation where rates of diabetes are number one in the U.S. I understand from the community, from patients of mine who have expressed a perception that we pr somehow prioritize the health care to the undocumented immigrants over the health care that we provide to the Native Americans. Before Operation Gatekeeper, when migration was at a trickle, natives were more than willing to help out. That's changed. They used to do chores for you, you know, clean your yard, chop wood, get water, and then they would feed them. Well, now because of the, now that there's so many agents present, they're always in a hurry. You know, they're trying to get to the next place, get to the next place. It's a typical day for Agent Sean King patrolling just outside the nation. He receives a tip from a local rancher. Down all the way to the fence and came back in, and about halfway between this road and that tank where it dead ends, we saw probably 15 of them coming up this direction. Okay, because we've got a group of 15 to 25 that we're looking for right in this area. Okay. Thank you, appreciate it. The presence of so many federal agents on Indian land has opened old wounds. Some even describe it as the reincarnated Wild West. We want Border Patrol, then Border Patrol's here in numbers, and then the double-edged sword is, well, there are too many, they're, they're, you know, we're constantly being stopped, and they're in our communities, and, and checking upon us there. Sometimes who the Border Patrol target as an illegal immigrant turns out to be a local. It was like two or three o'clock in the morning. And the lights came on and he stopped and Border Patrol ran over to his vehicle, weapons drawn, and they opened his door and they grabbed him and they took him out of the car. And he asked them, what gives you the right to treat me this way? And that Border Patrol that, that grabbed him pointed to his badge and he said, this is what gives me the right. We have our ways of uh, determining citizenship and one of the ways is questioning someone. And I can't determine citizenship by just looking at someone. I have to be able to determine them by asking where they were born and so on and so forth. So sure, we're going to question them more. It's like we live in a militarized zone with uh, law enforcement heading south and uh, immigrants heading north and we're caught in the middle. It's not just people crossing. Last year, 170,000 pounds of marijuana came across the border as well and natives are being drawn by the allure of easy money. Well, the uh, family lost his house because uh, the individual who, who was uh, unemployed at the time attempted to, to smuggle s uh, some, uh, some drugs and, uh, and he was caught and, 
and so the family was evicted as a result. This already marginalized community feels virtually invisible. I'm ready to go stand at the border and make this a bigger, bigger issue to um, bring attention to the problem here. Uh, if, if no one else is going to do something about it, then we need to get uh, a broader, wider attention to the problem that we're having here. Each year, the tribe has been spending over $3 million of their own money to deal with the problem, money they say they haven't seen from the federal government and the Department of Homeland Security. Today in the 21st century, we continue to be left out of the consultation process any time that there's um, policy relative to uh, the border and Homeland Security. We have to be at the table as well. Saunders has made frequent trips to Congress to lobby for more funding for a problem that she sees as the U.S.'s and that may be breaking the backbone of the nation. I often hear people who have good intentions uh, who come to the Tha Nation and say, we're going to move this problem somewhere else. Well, that's how we got stuck with the problem, because it was moved from elsewhere, another state, to the Tha and Nation. And I just don't understand the rationale. Maybe it's the old uh, uh, John Wayne uh, cowboys and Indians mentality that, you know, you've got the, the great white father in Washington, D.C. that's charged with protecting the savage Indians that you know well we know what's best for you you don't you savage Indians you don't know what's best for you that those days are gone they've been gone for years they remain very happy people I think inside they don't have much it's a very poverty stricken area um, but you walk down the street and you walk through the desert and you see that the kids are playing basketball and that they're going to work and they're happy with what, what with the little that they have which is so inspiring to do is deadbeat moms. I think the best way to show it is to go about it to showing a dad who's doing something what we would label a good mom doing. When the mom is nowhere in the picture and she's not su supporting anything, she's not helping her children, and she doesn't care, so therefore she would be a deadbeat, just like we would call a deadbeat, da a deadbeat dad.